Good day, wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandments to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like trees planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season so all that we do will prosper. This is week 48 of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words. The readings and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, and Hebrew-English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra-canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father, may you be with us and speak through us, and may all that we say be moved by your Spirit. Father, we are seeking truth, we are seeking your ways, we are seeking to understand and be obedient to your will. May you uncover and unveil things in this study that may help us become better and more equipped in the kingdom and sharing our love and light to others. We ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So this week portion, the Torah portion is from Deuteronomy chapter 20 through chapter 22nd. Prophet portion is Zephaniah chapter 2 through chapter 3. And Haggai chapter 1 through chapter 2. And Yeshua words include John chapter 17 through chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 20. If you go out to war against your enemies and you see a horse and a chariot, an army larger than you, you shall not be afraid because of them. For Yahweh your God is with you, the one who brought you from the land of Egypt. And then when you approach the battle, then the priest shall come near and speak to the troops. And he shall say to them, Here, Israel, you are near today to the battle against your enemies. Do not lose heart. You shall not be afraid, and you shall not panic, and you shall not be terrified because of them. For Yahweh your God is going with you to fight for you against your enemies to help you. And the officials shall speak to the troops, saying, Who is the man who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? Let him go and return to this house, so that he does not die in battle and another man dedicates it. And who is the man that has planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed it? Let him go and let him return to his house, so that he does not die in battle and another man enjoys it. And who is the man who got engaged to a woman and has not married her? Let him go and let him return to his house, so that he does not die in battle and another man marries her. And the officials shall continue to speak to the troops, and they shall say, What man is afraid and disheartened? Let him go, and let him return to his house, and let him not cause the heart of his brothers to melt like his. And when the officials have finished speaking to the army troops, then they shall appoint commanders of divisions at the head of the troops. When you approach a city to fight against it, you must offer it peace. And then if they accept your terms of peace and they surrender to you, and then all the people inhabiting it shall be forced labor for you, and they shall serve you. But if they do not accept your terms of peace and they want to make war with you, then you shall lay siege against it. And Yahweh your God will give it into your hand, and you shall kill all its males with the edge of the sword. Only the women and the little children and the domestic animals and all that shall be in the city, all of its spoil you may loot for yourselves. And you may enjoy the spoil of your enemies that Yahweh your God has given to you. Thus you shall do to all the far cities from you, which are not from the cities of these nations located nearby. But from the cities of these peoples that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance, you shall not let anything live that breathes. Rather, you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, just as Yahweh your God has commanded you, so that they may not teach you to do all their detestable things that they do for their gods, and thereby you sin against Yahweh your God. If you besiege a town for many days to make war against it in order to seize it, you shall not destroy its trees by wielding an axe against them, for you may eat from them, and so you must not cut them down. Are the trees of the field humans that they should come and siege against you? Only the trees that you know are not fruit trees you may destroy and you may cut down, and you may build siege works against that city that is making war with you until it falls. Okay, so thoughts and insights regarding chapter 20. So first, I would like to start with verses 5, 8, and 9. In Hebrew, those verses mention the word shotrim, which literally in modern Hebrew means cups. 
In English translations, this word appears as judges, scribes, officials, or officers. In this week's portion, the LXX translated this word into scribes, while the DSS translate, translated it into judges. So let us search for a second and third witness for the meaning of this word. We hear about Shotrim in Deuteronomy 16.18. You shall appoint judges and officials in Hebrew Shotrim for you in all your towns that Yahweh your God is giving to you throughout your tribes and they shall render for the people a righteous judgments. They are also referred to in Joshua 3.2 and 8.33. At the end of the three days, the officers passed through the midst of the camp. Then all Israel, foreigner, as well as native, with the elders, officials, and judges stood on either side of the ark before the priests and the Levites who carried the ark of the covenant of Yahweh. In 1 Chronicles 26, 29, 2 Chronicles 19, 11, and 2 Chronicles 34, 13, we are told that they were Levites. For that matter, during biblical times, judges, scribes, teachers of the law, as well as officers or cops, were all Levites. In fact, scribes were usually also priests. So I quoted here a few verses regarding the Shotrim, those officials, and as you can see, they are definitely not judged. From Chronic, from First Chronicles, Kenania uh, and his sons were appointed to the duties outside of Israel as officials and as judges. 9-11, Second Chronicle 19-11, and behold, Amaria the chief priest is over you in all matters of Yahweh, and Zebediah the son of Ishmael, the governor of the house of Judah, in all matters of the king, and the Levites shall be before you as officials. Be strong and do well, may Yahweh be with the upright. And Second Chronicles, Chronicles 34, 13, and some of the Levites were scribes, officials, shotrim, and gatekeepers. And not about biblical judges. Unlike our current model of executive and judicial branches, in biblical times, judges had extensive role and responsibilities in law enforcement. They were involved in every stage of the process of investigating and confirming a transgression, collecting evidence, cross-examining witnesses, and issuing a verdict. It seems that biblical cops or shotrim always reported up a hierarchy to a higher rank. These higher ranks were usually judges, commanders, and ministers or princes. As demonstrated above and in other references, biblical cops, quote-unquote, were most certainly neither judges nor scribes. They helped enlist and prepare men for battle, they supervised forced labor, and they were the administrative and executive arm of judges. In fact, they directly reported to judges. Next, uh, I would like to discuss Deuteronomy 20, 16 through 18. The verses, but from the cities of these peoples that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance, you shall not let anything live that breathe. Rather, you shall utterly destroy them you shall harem them. That's what it says in Hebrew. The Hittites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, just as Yahweh your God has commanded you, so that they may not teach you to do all their detestable things that they do for their gods, and, hereby, and thereby you sin against Yahweh your God. Harem or Cherem in Hebrew refers to the total destruction of the enemy and his goods at the conclusion of a campaign, or 
the uncompromising consecration of property and dedication of the property to God without possibility of recall or redemption. In other words, the concept of cherem refers to something that is taken out of the natural realm and devoted or set apart to Yahweh. This sets the conquest of Canaan as a spiritual warfare or a holy war. The question is, who was the cherem declared against? Please join me on this week's rabbit trail. First, let's start with who were the Canaanites, what was the nature of their religion. So I put a map here, and in the map you can see the different nations that Yahweh just mentioned as the nations that are going to be subject to Cherem. Okay, so the word Canaanite can be used as a generic term for the inhabitants of Canaan. In that sense, it encompasses all the nations located in Canaan. Sometimes it refers to one of the nations in particular. The various nations of Canaan are listed in this week's portion, Deuteronomy 2017, as well as in Genesis 15, 19 through 21 and Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 2. There are several passages which provide clues to their locations. Numbers 13, 29, the Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Joshua 11.3, the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, and Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mitzpeh. They worshipped a pantheon of gods who lived on Mount Tzaphon, which is north. Okay, Mount Zaphon was identified as Mount Akra in Syria. So the, pant the Pantheon of Gods was ruled by a tr the drunken El or Dagon and his consort Asherah. See week 46 portion for more details on Asherah. Like their later Greek and Roman counterparts, these gods were known for their all two human characteristics. In the Ras Shamra mythologies uncovered in the ruins of Ugarit, Baal sires a decoy of himself on a cow and later turns himself into a bull to rape his sister Anat. Anat wears a belt of the heads and hands of her victims and is depicted wading exultantly through rivers of blood. The gods hold orgies on Mount Zephon, sometimes including humans. Baal, known also as Bel, Marduk, Molek, depending on which nation is referring to him, was the primary god of the Canaanite fertility cult. He was often depicted as a man with the head and horns of a bull, who carried a lightning bolt symbolizing destruction and fertility. Baal supposedly won his dominance by defeating other deities such as the god of the sea and the god of storms. The Canaanites believed that his victory over death was repeated each year when he returned from the underworld and brought rain to renew the earth fertility. Because Hebrew culture believed the sea was evil and destructive, Baal's promise to prevent storms and control the sea, as well as his apparent ability to produce plentiful harvest, made him attractive to the Israelites. In various forms and with varying names, Asherah, Baal's mother as well as mistress, was honored as the primary fertility goddess, known also as Astarte, Ishtar, and the Queen of Heaven. Despite Yah's clear instructions, both Baal and Asherah worship were a perennial problem in Israel. It was to the Baals that the popular worship of the high places was paid, 
Asherah, on the other hand, was worshipped near trees and poles called Asherah poles. There are literally hundreds of references for this noxious degradation of worship in 1st Kings, 2nd Kings, and the major and minor prophets. Too many to list here. Priests in Canaan were political and religious leaders with absolute power over their follower. They practiced exorcism and various forms of divination. They were assisted by strato, homosexual priest, ritually neutered priestesses, lesbian transvestites, and female temple prostitutes. Among the most well-known of their practices was the invocation of sympathetic magic. To ensure land fertility, Canaanites held huge sexual orgies in which the priest had sex with any and all women they desired. The priest might also reenact Baal's copulation with cows and offer sacrifices of infant children. In some cases, Canaanites would have sex with one's closest living fleshly relative. Evidence indicates that Canaanites lived in a morbid dread of their priest. Marriages and families were shattered by their practices, and the unwanted children of these unions were often slaughtered on altars to Baal or Dagon. Sexually transmitted disease was likely epidemic. Rape was perhaps as common as it is in the worst of today's war-ravaged nations. According to Meryl F. Unger, excavations in Palestine have uncovered piles of ashes and remains of infant skeletons in cemeteries around heathen altars, pointing to the widespread practice of this cruel abomination. Halley's Bible Handbook says, Canaanites worshipped by immoral indulgence as a religious rite in the presence of their gods and then by murdering their firstborn children as a sacrifice to these same gods. It seems that in large measure, the land of Canaan had become a sort of Sodom and Gomorrah on a national scale. Did a civilization of such abominable filth and brutality have any right longer to exist? Archaeologists who dig in the ruins of Canaanite cities wonder that God did not destroy them sooner than he did. Learning about the reality of these practices is important. People should know and understand why these nations were condemned to destructions. On the right side of this slide, I also summed up what a ritualistic Baal worship looks like, and I invite you to read it. I prefer not to read it because it's really abominable. But there is more to this than meets the eye. In Numbers 13, 32 through 33, we learn that the Israelite spies saw unusually tall giant people groups everywhere they went in the land. They existed in large numbers throughout the Canaanite population. The verses say, And they presented the report of the land that they explored to the Israelites, saying, the land that we went through to explore is a land that eats its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in its midst are mean men of great size. There we saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their eyes. And in Deuteronomy 9, 1 through 7, we learn the rationale for the cherem and annihilation was the specific elimination of the descendants of the Nephilim. Hear, O Israel, you are about to cross the Jordan today to go to, dis to dispossess nations larger and more numerous than you, great cities fortified with high walls. A great and tall people, the son of the Anakites, whom you know and whom you have heard of, 
it is said, who could stand before the sons of Anak? You should know today that Yahweh your God is the one crossing ahead of you as a devouring fire. He will destroy them and he will subdue them before you. So you will dispossess them and you will destroy them quickly just as Yahweh promised you. You shall not say to yourself when Yahweh your God is driving them out before you, saying, Because of my righteousness, Yahweh brought me to take possession of this land. But because of the wickedness of these nations, Yahweh is driving them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness and because of the uprightness of your heart that you are coming to take possession of their land. But because of the wickedness of these nations, Yahweh your God is driving them before you. And in order to confirm the promise that Yahweh swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Okay. Now page 15. There are a range of verbs for what the conquest was supposed to do and what it did do, several of which don't speak of killing or annihilation. For example, to drive out, to dispossess, drive out again. Tons of references here. The conquest account begins in Moses' days in the Transjordan, which is specifically aimed at Sihon, Sihon and Og. The latter is clearly a giant, and both are referred to as Rephaim, a term linked to the Anakim in Deuteronomy 2.11. Kings, king kings of the Rephaim or Amorites, <clears throat> consequently the co conquest begins with giant clans in view. As one proceeds through the conquest in the book of Joshua, the subsequent uses of Cherem coincide at places where Anakim giants were seen and known to be present. The particular usage frames the general instance. This is how Joshua sums up the conquest. Joshua 11, 21 through 23. And Joshua came at the time and cut off the Anakim from the hill country, from Hebron, from the Beer, from Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua devoted them to destruction with their cities. There was none of the Anakim left in the land of the people of Israel. Only in Gaza, in Gad, and in Ashdod did some remain. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses, and Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allot allotments, and the land had rest from war. Notice that the conquest is defined as a success along specific lines, elimination of the Anakim from the hill country so that none of them were in Israel land. This is why the map up that occurred afterward in the days of Joshua also focused on the elimination of the Anakim by Caleb. So I gave a link here at the bottom of this slide from Dr. Michael, the giant clans and the conquest. It's a very interesting article and he's uh, promoting this uh, concept that I'm promoting here that the Anakim were most likely the subject of the Cherem. Who were those Nephilim and Anakim? Genesis 6.4 the Nephilim were upon the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of Elohim, typically angels or supernatural beings, went into the daughters of humankind and they bore children to them. These were the mighty warriors that were from ancient times men of renown. To learn more about them, we turn to three extra canonical books found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The first one is the Book of Enoch, comprising, comprising over 100 chapters, still surviving its entirety in, in the Ethiopic language, and forms an important source for the thought of Judaism in the last few centuries BCE. It is considered canonical by the Ethiopian Jews as well as by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and the Eritrean 
Orthodox Church. It is a composite work that is generally grouped into five books that I listed here. Eleven almost complete copies of the Book of Enoch in Aramaic have been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, including fragments of all of these sections with the exception of the Book of Parables. It is clear that the Qumran community considered it a vitally important text. Evidence that the Book of Enoch was influential at Qumran is provided by the reuse in many other DSS texts. This include the Aramaic text of a Levi document, Testament of Canaan, Pseudo Daniel, Genesis Apocryphon, as well as additional Hebrew text and the Book of Jubilee. Enoch was accepted as an authoritative work by some early Christian writers and church fathers. They it is quoted almost verbatim in the Epistle of Jude and in First and Second Peter appear to draw on the same ideas. Additionally, the demonology of the Gospels and other parts of the New Testament ultimately derives from ideas first expressed in Enochic literature. It is described also as scripture in the Epistle of Barnabas, Tertullian, I also view the Book of Enoch as sacred scripture and it was ac accepted by many of the early Christians. So according to the Book of Enoch, the mingling of angel and human was actually the idea of Shemiyaza, the leader of the evil angels who lured 200 others to co cohabit with women. The offspring of these unnatural unions were giants 450 feet tall. The fallen angels and the giants began to oppress the human population and to teach them to do evil. The fallen angels taught humans the science of medicines, acts of sorcery, divination, and other forbidden knowledge. For this reason, Yahweh determined to imprison the angels until the final judgment and to destroy the earth with a flood. Enoch's efforts to intercede with heaven for the fallen angels were unsuccessful. No less intriguing is the fact that additional previously unknown or little known texts were discovered at Qumran. The most important of these is the Book of Giants. And the Book of Giants tells more or less the same story, except it goes into a little bit more details about the two sons of Shemiyaza. And another thing I wanted to mention is when you read these manuscripts, you can't help but hearing genetic engineering. So according to the Dead Sea Scrolls fragments of the Book of Giants, the angels that descended on earth observed the creations of the earth humans, animals, and plants. And since they knew some of the secrets of heaven, they applied the teachings to the earthly creations in order to create different species by interbreeding the creatures of the earth. From other cultures and ancient writings, we can conclude that they experimented not only with animals, but they mixed human DNA with that of animals as well producing all kinds of monsters that they most likely used as slaves, as seen from ancient reliefs like the ones found in Babylon. The Book of Jubilee, also known as the Little Genesis, is an ancient Jewish religious work of 50 chapters, considered canonical by Ethiopian Jews and by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. About 15 Jubilee scrolls were found in five caves among the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran. All the scrolls were written in Hebrew, which makes this book very ancient, much older than what uh, scholars uh, would like us to believe. The Book of Jubilees also narrates about the story of how a group of fallen angels mated with mortal female, given, giving Christ to Nephilim, a race of giants. I gave a few quotes from the Book of Jubilees here, and the last quote is very interesting. It basically tells us that the fallen angels' teachings came to dominate the earth post-flood because there was a descendant called Canaan that found the writing 
of former generations, that former generations had carved on the rock and he read what was there on and he transcribed it and sinned owning to it, for it contained the scientific, literally, in Hebrew it says Mada, which is science, the scientific teaching of the watchers. So this person found this writing after yes. the flood and then was able to yes and replicate it. it replicated it and taught it to other people and that's how the teachings were revived and passed right. on later and what's interesting the word that is used in the book of jubilee and remember it's hebrew it wasn't even trans you can't even say it was translated it was found in hebrew the word is mada and mada is science so that's really interesting. So a spiritual battle that started long before the conquest of Canaan. The conquest shouldn't be portrayed as random genocide or ethnic cleansing. The composition and wickedness of the Canaanite society was anticipated in Genesis 15:16 and described in moral and social terms in both Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The conquest of Canaan was an act of Yahweh's justice and punishment on a morally degraded society, a society comprising in part of offspring of the defiled union of the sons of Elohim or fallen angels with human women, a society that followed the corrupt teachings of these fallen angels and the abominable practices promoted by their offspring. Let's not forget that Yahweh threatened to do the same to Israel, and he did. In the conquest, Yahweh used Israel as the agent of punishment on the Canaanites. However, Yahweh repeatedly warned Israel that if they behaved like the Canaanites, he would treat them as his enemy in the same way and inflict the same punishment on them using other nations as agents of punishment. In the course of Israel's long history, Yahweh repeatedly did just that, demonstrating his moral consistency across humanity. It wasn't a matter of favoritism. If anything, Israel's status as Yahweh's chosen people exposed them even more to Yahweh's judgment. Those who chose to live as Yahweh's enemies eventually faced Yahweh's wrath and judgment. I quoted a few verses here from Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Joshua in support of what I just said. From Leviticus, and I will set my face against you and shall be the the and you shall be defeated before your enemies, and your haters shall rule over you, and you shall flee away, but there shall not be anybody who is pursuing you. In Deuteronomy, Yahweh shall cause you to be defeated before your enemies. On one road you shall go against them, but you will flee on seven roads before them, and you shall become a thing of horror to all of the kingdoms of the earth, and your dead bodies shall be as food for all the birds of the heaven and to the animals of the earth, and there shall not be anyone to frighten them away. And all these curses shall come over you, and they shall pierce you, and they shall overtake you until you are destroyed, because you did not listen to the voice of Yahweh your God by observing His commandments and His statutes that He commanded you. And they shall be among you as a sign and an end as a wonder, and among your offspring forever. One last thought. One of the purposes Yahweh intended for the Mosaic Covenant was to keep Israel apart, separate and unique. In other words, holy or set apart. However, as we find out later, the Israelite failed to achieve that divine directive. Psalms 106, 34-42 
They did not exterminate the peoples as Yahweh had commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and learned their works and served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and daughters to the demons, and they poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and so the land was defiled with the blood, and they became unclean by their works, and were unfaithful in their deeds. So Yahweh's anger burned against his people, and he abhorred his inheritance. Then he gave them into the hand of the nations, and those who hated them ruled over them. And their enemies oppressed them, and they were subdu subdued under their hand. I'm going to skip Judges. Like the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood, the story of Canaan's conquest stands in scripture as a prototypical narrative or one that foreshadows what is to come. Scripture affirms that ultimately in the final judgment, the wicked will face the awful reality of Yahweh's wrath through exclusion, punishment, and destruction. Then Yahweh's ethical justice will finally be vindicated. But it's not all lost. Rahab's story set in the midst of the conquest narrative also demonstrate the power of repentance, faith, and Yahweh's willingness to spare his enemies when they choose obedience to Yahweh. Rahab thus enters obedience all of fame and faith. Hebrews 11.31 By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she welcomed the spies in peace. James 2.25 And likewise was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by a different route? Very interesting. I wanted to add, after listening to that, a couple things that we've covered in the last week last two weeks is the purge um, and that's what we see is that Yahweh is continuously seeking his children to obey and those who are disobedient must be purged so that and you answer the thought on har harem, harem. <laughs> harem. <laughs> yeah so that word specifically is against a specific people yeah for their destruction yeah, he declared it on the nations of Canaan, and my point was that the main object within the Canaanites was the Anakim. Those are the offspring of the defiled union. So the destruction of these, quote, peoples was due to not only the horrific nature they lived, as you, yes. you read, but yes. also from them being the offspring of that seed. Excellent. Deuteronomy chapter 21. If someone slain is found in the land that Yahweh your God is giving to you to take possession of it and is lying in the field, and it is not known who killed him, then your elders and your judges shall go out and shall measure the distance to the cities that are around the slain one. And then the nearest city to the slain one, the elders of that city shall take a heifer of the herd that has not been worked within the field, that has not pulled a yoke, and the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a wadi that flows with water all year, and that has not been plowed and has not been sown. Then there they shall break the neck of the heifer in the wadi. Then the priests, the descendants of Levi, shall come near, for Yahweh your God has chosen them to bless in the name of Yahweh. And every legal dispute and every case of assault will be subject to their ruling. And all of the elders of that city nearest to the slain person shall wash their hands over the heifer with the broken neck in the wadi. And they shall declare, and they shall say, Our hands did not shed this blood, and our eyes did not see what was done. Forgive your people, Israel, whom you redeemed, Yahweh, and do not allow the guilt of innocent blood in the midst of your people, Israel. And let them be forgiven with regard to blood, and so you shall purge the innocent blood from your midst, because you must do the right thing in the eyes of Yahweh. When you go out for battle against your enemies, and Yahweh your God gives them into your hand, and you lead the captives away, and you among the captives a woman beautiful in appearance, and you become attached to her, and you want to take her as a wife. 
Then you shall bring her into your household, and she shall shave her head, and she shall trim her nails, and she shall remove the clothing of her captivity from her, and she shall remain in your house, and she shall mourn her father and her mother a full month, and after this you may have sex with her, and you may marry her, and she may become your wife. And then if you do not take delight in her, then you shall let her go to do whatever she wants, but you shall not treat her as a slave, since you have dishonored her. If a man has two wives, and the one is loved, and the other one is disliked, and the one loved, and the one that is disliked have borne for him sons, if it happens that the firstborn son belongs to the one that is disliked, nevertheless it will be the case that on the day of bestowing his inheritance upon his sons, he will not be allowed to treat as the firstborn son the son of the beloved wife in preference to the son of the disliked wife who is the firstborn son. But he shall acknowledge the firstborn son of the disliked wife by giving him the double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruit of his vigor. To him is the legal claim of the birthright. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not listen to the voice of his father and to the voice of his mother, and they discipline him, and he does not obey them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him, and they shall bring him out to the elders of his city and to the gate of his town. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious, he does not obey us, and he is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him with stones and let him die. And so you shall purge the evil from your midst, and all of Israel will hear, and they will fear. And if a man commits a sin punishable by death, and so he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his dead body shall not hang on the tree, but certainly you shall bury him on that day, for cursed by God is one that is being hung. So you shall not defile your land that Yahweh your God is giving to you as an inheritance. I'll quickly recap it on verse 9. It talks about unsolved murders. There was a typo here. What we read is not purging the innocent blood from your midst because you do the right thing in the eyes of Yahweh, as we were just talking earlier about purging. So this purging he's clarifying you must do the right thing and this statement of purging of innocent blood must be done and i just wanted to point that out that it's all because you must do the right thing the marrying of female captives the one thing i wanted to point out on that one and that's in verses 10 to 14 a beautiful woman captive so if they find favor in the captive and they see a beautiful woman and they want to marry her or have her the requirement is for them to shave her head, cut her nails, and also it talked about her getting rid of the clothes of her captivity. So whatever she was wearing before, now she's going to be just wearing regular plain stuff. And I believe this is being done for a couple reasons, that a lot of these other nations would wear makeup and all of the, I guess you would say, adornery that they would wear. So here you're more or less humbling this woman, shaving her head, nails, getting rid of the, that type of clothing and just having her look plain. And if this is more or less what I believe to see, was it the beauty? Is it the beauty that you really wanted? Is this woman still beautiful to you after all of this that's done? And also during this 30 days, her mourning her parents, you also get to observe her behavior in that sense before you can make that commitment. So I, I see it as something that Yahweh is putting forth to keep the men from acting foolishly. So it's given a 30 day time to evaluate and also to eliminate the physical beauty that they quote fell in love with or liked to really evaluate if this is the right decision for them to take this type of woman. That's so interesting to listen to your perspective on it because I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's just so interesting as a man, that's what you saw. And it's just fascinating to me that I wasn't, I did not, this did not occur to me when I read that verse. Oh, so. uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. what first caught me was it said a beautiful woman. And I'm like, okay, why would he say beautiful woman? And then yeah. as I read on what they were to do, I was like, okay, shaving the hair <laughs> off, getting rid of the hair, the beauty of the hair, and then the nails, how the women can do the nails up, and then the clothing. So it's, and then also the 30 days of mourning yeah. they are to observe. And then the rebellious son we read in 18 to 21. This one could be tough for a lot of people, but you see here, it outlines exactly what's going on with this son, stubborn, rebellious, does not listen, and they discipline him, and he does not obey. Okay, so he's totally disrespecting the parents, not listening, not just total defiance. And then they bring him forth, in forth to the elders of the city so they can have judgment and basically prove it, be a witness that all of this is happening. 
and their son is still stubborn, rebellious, does not obey, he's a glutton and drunkard. So he's in front of the men of the city. We get from this statement that he was a drunkard, so he must have been of a drinking age. And I can't remember where else I read this, where this is also written, but he's more or less given another chance here by the elders, and if, they, if he still does not want to obey, then stone him. And once again here, it says, you shall purge the evil from your midst. Very specific here on this rebellious son. It's stating, purge the evil, and all of Israel will hear and they will fear. So that was very interesting, and it gave clarity as to why you just don't beat your children and kill them. It's disciplining them, and it says he was constant in this. He just kept doing this. 22 to 23, if a man commits a sin punishable by death, hang him on a tree. Bury him on that day, for cursed by Elohim is that being hung. So you should not defile the land. So you bury him that day and not let him his dead body hang there overnight. And then we read in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 20, 25, you were called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his footsteps. Who did not commit sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth? Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return? When suffering, he did not threaten. He entrusted himself to the one who judges justly who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. So we see here, Yeshua was nailed to the tree. And what people understand this is that he had a cross beam, and with that cross beam that he carried, he was then nailed to a tree for his crucifixion. So since I already used most of my quota of talking for today <laughs> in my rabbit trail, I'll try to do it quickly. So the verse that caught my attention, the three verses, 15 through 17, if a man has two wives and the one is loved and the other one is disliked and the one loved and the one that is disliked have born for him sons, if it happens that the firstborn son belongs to the one that is disliked, Nevertheless, it will be the case that on the day of bestowing his inheritance upon his sons, he will not be allowed to treat as the firstborn son the son of the beloved wife in preference to the son of the disliked wife who is the firstborn son and so on. So one of the hallmarks of Deuteronomy is the human treatment of the weak and marginal. The sons of lesser loved wife, regardless of the marriage arrangements, would have been especially vulnerable to being mistreated. So this law is clearly, in my eyes, it's clearly linked to Jacob's giving Reuben's firstborn rights to Joseph in Genesis. This case of a favored wife and her firstborn plays an important role in the Jacob and Joseph narratives. Leah's son Reuben was Jacob's firstborn and should have received the inheritance and rights of the firstborn as opposed to Rachel's firstborn son Joseph. And yet Genesis strongly implies, even if he does not say this outright, that Joseph and not Reuben is given the birth right. When Jacob blesses his son at the end of Genesis, Reuben is not blessed but cursed. Jacob explicitly recognizes Reuben's status as the firstborn, but at the same time explains that Reuben is being rejected by him on account of Reuben's sin with Bilhah in Genesis 35:22, In contrast, in his private conversation with Joseph, Jacob tells him that he is receiving an extra portion beyond that of his brothers. A comparison of this text about Joseph's double portion and Jacob's curse of Reuben implies that Joseph is receiving the birthright in place of Reuben. First Chronicle makes explicit what is implicit in Genesis. The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but when he defiled the bed of his father, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, so that he was not enrolled in the genealogy as the firstborn. What Jacob does with Reuben and Joseph, the firstborn son respectively of his unloved wife and loved wife, violates the inheritance laws reflected in Deuteronomy. 
Reuben's sin gives Jacob a special reason to do it. But we can't ignore the fact that Deuteronomy doesn't list any exceptions to this rule. So that's interesting in my eyes. The yes. second thing is that I feel that the, this Jacob's violation of this law contributed to schism, most likely beyond, almost beyond repair, okay? So Rachel and Leah, two sisters, the two wives of Jacob and two of the matriarchs of our people, two powerful but contrasting personalities. So. A cursory look gives the impression that the story of Rachel and Leah is about hatred, jealousy, and deceit. However, it's not that simple. Uh, they, we have several examples here that I listed of how Rachel was kind to Leah and Leah was kind to Rachel in spite of the competition between them. <clears throat> Yet, the, and then I go on and say that the vast gulf dividing their respective worlds not only affected their own lives, but continued as a rift in the lives of their offspring. The rivalry between Joseph, Rachel Child, and his brothers, primarily Leah's children, who sought to kill him, marked the tip of the schism. It was Moses, Leah's descendant, who delivered the Israelites from their bondage in Egypt, but only Joshua, Moses' disciple and Rachel's descendant, who was able to lead the nation into the promised land. The rulership of the first national king, King Saul, Rachel's descendant, was cut short by King David, Leah's descendant, through whom a dynasty would be established. So the schism kept resurfacing again and again with the constant strife and divisiveness between the kingship of Israel and the kingship of Judah. However, an interesting point to note is that the kingdom of Judah was comprised of the tribes of Judah, Leah's descendant, and Benjamin, Rachel's descendant, as well as much of the tribe of Levi, Leah's descendant. So it's like ups and downs all along. That's interesting. Back and forth, and then it's a mixture. Yes, exactly. And Benjamin was always very attached to Judah, always. So that's an interesting one. Deuteronomy chapter 22. You shall not watch the ox of your neighbor or his sheep or goat strain and ignore them. Certainly you shall return them to your neighbor. And if your countryman is not near you or you do not know who he is, then you shall bring it to your household, and it shall be with you until your countryman seeks after it, and you shall return it to him. And thus also you shall do regarding his donkey, and thus you shall do concerning his garment. And so you shall do with respect to all of the lost property of your countryman that is lost from him, and you find it. You are not allowed to withhold help. You shall not see the donkey of your neighbor or his ox fallen on the road, and you ignore them. Certainly you must help them get up along with him. The apparel of a man shall not be put on a woman, and a man shall not wear the clothing of a woman. Because everyone who does these things is detestable to Yahweh your God. If a bird's nest is found before you on the road in any tree or on the ground, and there are chicks or eggs, and the mother is lying down on the chicks or the eggs, you shall not take the mother along with the young. You shall certainly let the mother go, but you may take the young for yourselves. Do this so that it may go well for you and you may live long in the land. When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet wall for your roof, so that you will not bring blood gold on your house if anyone should fall from it. You shall not sow your vineyard with differing kinds of seed, so that you shall not forfeit the whole harvest, both the seed that you sowed and the yield of the vineyard. You shall not plow with an ox and with a donkey yoked together. You shall not wear woven material made of wool and linen mixed together. You shall make tassels for yourselves on the four corners of your clothing with which you cover yourself. If a man takes a woman and he has sex with her, but he then dislikes her, and he accuses her falsely, and he defames her, and he says this woman I took and I lay with her and I discovered that she was not a virgin, then in defense the father of the young woman shall take, along with her mother, and together they must bring out the evidence of the virginity of the young woman to display it to the elders of the city at the city gate. And then the father of the young woman shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man as wife, but he now dislikes her. And now look, he has accused her falsely, saying, I did not find your daughter a virgin, but here is evidence of the virginity of my daughter. And they shall spread the cloth out before the elders of the city. Then the elders of that city shall take the man, and they shall discipline him. Then they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver, and they shall give them to the father of the young woman, for he defamed an Israelite young woman. 
and she shall become his wife. He will not be allowed to divorce her all his days. But if this charge was true, and the signs of virginity were not found for the young woman, and then they shall bring out the young woman to the doorway of the house of her father, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones, and she shall die, because she did a disgraceful thing in Israel by playing the harlot in the house of her father, and so you shall purge the evil from your midst. If a man is found lying with a married woman, then they shall both die, both of them, the man who lay with the woman and the woman also, so you shall purge the evil from Israel. If it happens that a young woman, a virgin, is engaged to a man, and a man finds her in the town and lies with her, then you shall bring out both of them to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them with stones so that they shall die, the young woman because she did not cry out in the town, and the man because he violated his neighbor's wife, and so you shall purge the evil from your midst. But if the man finds the young engaged woman in the field and the man overpowers her and he has sex with her, then the man only must die who lay with her. But you shall not do anything to the young woman, for there is not reckoned against the young woman a sin deserving death. It is similar to when a man rises up against his neighbor and murders him, a fellow human being. Just so is this case. For he found her in the field, the engaged young woman cried out, but there was no rescuer to help her. If a man finds a young woman, a virgin who is not engaged, and he seizes her and he has sex with her and they are caught, and the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman fifty shekels of silver, and she shall become his wife because he violated her, and he is not allowed to divorce her during his lifetime. A man may not take the wife of his father, and so he may not dishonor his father. Okay, so I must say this chapter is full of goodness, all kind of goodies that I could have discussed forever, but I chose not to because I already produced enough slides yeah, for there, this evening. Yeah, there was a lot, and I only touched on three that I picked on this. I did not want to touch the whole woman piece because that would have taken many slides to talk that one out. So I'm just going to touch quickly on these three. The first two on verses 9 and 11 it goes back to that mixing and different seeds and different woven materials. It's all about that purity and not mixing of things. As we've seen with the fallen angels and the humans, you're not to mix those. Everything must stay with its kind. So we see in verse 9, you shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed. And that matches up with what was spoken of in Leviticus 19.19. 19. You must keep my statutes. As for your domestic animals, you shall not cause the two different kinds to breed. As for your field, you shall not sow two different kinds of seeds. And a garment of two different kinds of woven material should not be worn on you. And that goes with 11. You shall not wear woven material made of wool and linen mixed together. And once again, back to Leviticus 19.19 19, where it says two different kinds of woven material. So the way I'm reading that and what I've looked up is most people don't go with the the wool and the linen mixture, obviously because it's specifically mentioned. But the question is, what about any other type of materials that's mixed? So if you're wearing a cotton shirt, should it be strictly cotton and not cotton and rayon or whatever? Or is it talking about organic materials, wool and linen? Does the thick materials count or is that or is it not because it's not specifically mentioned? Or do you just take it as I, as I mentioned, two different materials, period? I'll lay that out. What do you think? I want to say that whenever I see these verses, both in um, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, for me it spells that way beyond this, that we are, n if we are not supposed to mix two different materials in one fabric, or we are not even supposed to mix two different animals on the same plowing the same field then of course we cannot mix genes and we cannot tamper with DNA so for me I see here the basic of genetic engineering and how we are forbid from doing anything that might imply that might cause any defilement of the original creation, any tainting of the original creation. And looking at the words I was thinking about, what about dogs, different breeds of dogs? And the wording here says, you shall not cause. So I guess if it happens, but you shall not be causing it and I guess breeding different mixtures. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You shouldn't be the cause of yeah. that. The way and, I, like that. and based on the extra canonical books that I mentioned before, we can see that the 
fallen angels and uh, their offspring were engaged actively in contaminating as creation by intermixing and breeds and contaminating DNA and that's why the flood occurred and I do feel when you look at science especially in the last couple of decades they are actively genetically engineering everything including mixing human genes with animal genes or plant genes so I really do feel that these are like the days of pre-flood days yeah because yeah. we see the mixture of the of different species and that's where we get a lot of what we know as of today in the pantheon or the mythological creatures half horse half human yeah. the centaurs the satires the mermaids all of that stuff yeah. and then here in verse 12 you shall make tassels for yourselves on the four corners of your clothing which you cover yourself we see it also outlined in numbers 15 37 to 40 Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall let them make for themselves fringes upon the borders of their garments throughout their generations. And ye shall put upon the fringes of the borders a blue lace, and ye shall look on them, and ye shall remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. Ye shall not turn back from your imaginations, and after the sight of your eyes, and the things after which you were going whoring, that ye may remember and perform all my commands, and ye shall be holy unto your God. And we see that these tassels are a reminder of obedience. And the children of Israel are reminded that's why they are to wear these, to remember the commands of the Lord and be obedient to them. And when you look up the terms about four corners of your clothing, the term four corners, we've seen that idiom in, in other places, the four corners of the earth. And so when you're talking about the idiom, it's all around. You could take the thought of wearing tassels literally all around, maybe on the bottom of your shirt, how someone would have little tassels all the way around. We've seen that on dresses and etc. But nowadays it's taken as four tassels on four edges or corners of your shirt. I personally wear two because I covered two sides, which is all around to me. It's either minimum of two or maximum of however many you could fit on. So that's at least my thought. Yeah. And the verse that you mentioned from Nam reminds me of the thought that I had in week 40, in week 46 portion when I talked about the eyes so notice how he's saying again that you should not turn back after your imaginations and after the sight of your eyes okay so the eyes again are so dominant in us stumbling so I think if there is a connection here like having the tassels so your eyes will be busy looking at the tassels and remembering what you are reminding you and remembering what you are supposed to be doing rather than whoring after the wrong things. Yeah, if, if everyone in the land is wearing tassels, you're not just looking at yours, but you're looking at everyone exactly, else's. Exactly, it's a reminder. So it's reminding you, everyone here yeah. and myself, yeah. remain obedient. Yeah. yeah. Zephaniah chapter 1 The word of Yahweh that came to Zephaniah the son of Cushi, the son of Jedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah son of Ammon, king of Judah, I will surely destroy everything from the face of the earth, a declaration of Yahweh. I will destroy humanity and beast, I will destroy the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off humankind from the face of the earth, a declaration of Yahweh. And I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal, and the name of idolatrous priests with the priests, and those who bow down on the rooftops to the hosts of heaven, and those who bow down, swearing to Yahweh but also swearing by Milcom, and those who turned back from following Yahweh, and who did not seek Yahweh, and did not inquire of him. Be silent before the Lord Yahweh, for the day of Yahweh draws near. For Yahweh has provided a sacrifice and has consecrated his guests. And it will happen on the day of the sacrifice of Yahweh, I will punish the officials, and the sons of the king, and all those who dress in foreign clothing. And on that day I will punish all who leap over the threshold, who fill up the house of their master with violence and deceit. And there shall be on that day a declaration of Yahweh, a loud outcry from the fish gate, and a wailing from the second district, and a loud crashing from the hills. The inhabitants of the mortar shall wail, for all the traders have perished, all who trade with silver have been cut off. 
And it shall be that at that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men whose senses are dull from drinking, who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good, nor will he do evil, and their wealth shall be as plunder, and their homes as desolation. And they shall build their houses and not inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and not drink their wine. The great day of Yahweh draws near, it is near and coming very swiftly. The sound of the day of Yahweh is bitterness, there a warrior cries out. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of disaster and ruination, a day of darkness and deep gloom, a day of clouds and thick clouds, a day of trumpet and trumpet blast against the fortified cities and against the high corner towers. And I will bring distress to all humankind, and they shall walk about like the blind, for they sinned against Yahweh, their blood shall be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Moreover, their silver and their gold will not be able to save them on the day of the wrath of Yahweh. And in the fire of his zeal the whole land shall be consumed, for a terrifying end he shall make for all the inhabitants of the land. Okay, so before we start, I just wanted, that you can see there is a lot of colorful comments here, so you can see that up to the previous chapters of Deuteronomy, we hardly had any variance between the versions, but in this, in Zephaniah chapter 1, we are already seeing several colors denoting quite a bit of variance, and some of them are significant or highly significant between the versions. Looking for the one. Yeah, most of the variants coming from the LXX to the Masoretic, and one of them that particularly caught my attention was verse 11 where the English verse translated the word machtesh to mortar and machtesh is actually crater so it's interesting I don't know why they translated it to mortar but it's crater it actually shows in the fragment of the Dead Sea Scroll it's machtesh also crater so I thought it's interesting, remember, because we talked about, we visited the Mahtesh Ramon and we thought that maybe something happened there. So I thought it's a very interesting thing. There are only two verses in the entire Old Testament where that word is used. If the theory of the kingdom is being taken off the earth, at some point and this would fit in that the people were wailing in the creator meaning they were left behind so yeah. to speak and yeah that's very yeah. interesting so it could be like um, like we need to park that verse and go back to it when we do millennial kingdom okay some more variants here in red that are pretty significant between the versions i don't I think I have time to do a lot of this, but anyway, you can proceed with your work on this. Chapter. Yeah, so on Zephaniah 1, I will surely destroy everything from the face of the earth, a declaration of Yahweh. And this was uh, declared during the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, from, from through Zephaniah. On that day, and we see this term many times, on that day, etc., the day of Yahweh. He's saying here, on that day, be silent before Yahweh. We've seen that in similar phraseology in Revelation, where all of heaven will be silent for 30 minutes. So that could be a tie-in with that, possibly. And a loud outcry and a loud crashing from the hills. So there's going to be some loud noises coming out and about during this day. And we know destruction, etc. So it's definitely going to have some crashing, whether it's lightning or just earthquakes, etc. Noise and sound. Verse 7, Yahweh has provided a sacrifice and has consecrated his guests. And 8, I will punish the officials and the sons of the king and all those who dress in foreign clothing. <laughs> So why would he mention this in Zephaniah that Yahweh will punish the officials, the sons of kings, and all those who dress in foreign clothing? We read in Matthew 22, 8 through 14, this piece here. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding celebration is ready, but those who had been invited were not worthy. Therefore, go out, this is Yeshua given the parable of this marriage ceremony. Therefore, go out to the places where the roads exit the city and invite to the wedding celebration as many people as you find. And those slaves went out into the roads and gathered everyone whom they found, both evil and good. And the wedding celebration was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to see the dinner guests, he saw a man there 
not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here not having wedding clothes? Meaning he wasn't invited because everyone had wedding clothes on, the ones that were brought in and invited. He could say nothing. And then the king said to the servants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him out, throw him into outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. So it's a very interesting that he mentions this and it totally ties in with this parable of this wedding ceremony that Yeshua uses what's happening in this time. Verse 9, I will punish all who leap over the threshold, who fill up the house of their master with violence and deceit. So who are these leapers? We read in Psalms 84.10, Because better is the day in your courtyards than a thousand elsewhere, I would rather be at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell into tents of wickedness. There's no leaping or crossing unless invited or qualified. And that was the problem with those leaping. And that's why he's punishing them, those who leap. You, you just can't come in. You can't do what you want to do. You can't just walk into the temple. You can't walk into a sacred holy place. or Just name it. There's a requirement. There's obedience. And then 12, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the uninterested. And I put in there uncommitted depending on how you want to translate that word. And in 15 and 16, that day will be a day of wrath, trouble, distress, disaster, ruination, darkness, deep gloom, clouds, thick clouds, a day of a trumpet. Okay, so we see here, he's going to search the land first with the, with lamps. And I refer, refer that to the, uh, the 10 virgins, the five wise and the five foolish, uh, searching through those who are, who are committed and he's gonna punish the uncommitted. So we reread where the foolish virgins didn't have enough oil, they had to go buy it, they came back, it was too late. And so he will punish those that were uncommitted. They were not committed. And that's what you get out of that, that parable of the 10 virgins. And then I read back on that day, wrath, judgment, etc., and the day of trumpet, and the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he will make an end, a terrible end, to them all that dwell in the land. And so that day is also marked by a trumpet. So however you want to take that, we, there's so many things we could tie in with that, but we have a day of trumpets. Will that, day, will that be on that day? Or is it just marked by that day of a new day of a trumpet that will signify it? We'll see if we find out or not in this lifetime. So I just had one comment here on the Sephaniah 1.4 and I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal going back to Baal and the name of, and the name of idolatrous priest and in Hebrew it's Kmarim with the priest Kohanim. So the word, I was shocked to see that word because I thought it's modern Hebrew word, uh, but it's used twice in the Old Testament. And I checked it was used in the Dead Sea Scroll also, so it's not an invention of rabbinical uh, Masoretic version. So the word Kmarim refers to idolatrous priest. In its two other appearances in the Bible, Josiah removed the idolatrous priest, again it's using the word Kmarim, who offered incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellation, and to all the hosts of heaven. And in Hosea, indeed his people will mourn for it, and his idolatrous priest, again Kmarim, will wail over it, over its glory, because it has departed from it. So, the second word, Kohanim, is the normal term for priest and is used for both legitimate and idolatrous priests in the Bible. This may indicate that some legitimate priests function also as idolatrous priests. And then I just quoted from Jeremiah 32, 26 through 35. And the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah saying, Look, I am Yahweh, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Therefore thus says Yahweh, Look, I am going to give this city into the hand of the Chaldean, and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and he will capture it. And the Chaldeans who are fighting against this city will come and set this city on fire, and they will burn it. 
and the houses where they have made smoke offerings on the roofs to Baal and where they have where they have devoted libations to other gods in order to provoke me to anger for the people of Israel and the people of Judah were doing only evil in my eyes from their youth and then he goes on and says for this city has been for me a cause of my anger and of my wrath from the day they, that they built it even until this day so I will remove from it I will remove it from my sight. And then he mentions they, their kings, their officials, their priests, and their prophet, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all of them did evil in his eyes. They set up their abom abominations in the house that is called by my name to defile it. They build the high places of Baal that are in the valley of Ben Hinnom to present their offering, their sons and their daughters to Molech. Molech is another name for Baal. So when we look at the testament of Levi, which is another manuscript found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and by the way, each time you see a blue highlighted in blue with underline, just click on it. There is a link that will take you to an ebook or a PDF online for that book that I mentioned. So the testament of Levi, Levi warns his children as follows. And in the seventh week shall become priests who are idolaters, adulterers, lovers of money, proud, lawless, lascivious, abusers of children and beasts. Wow. And after their punishment shall have come from the Lord, the priesthood shall fail. Okay, and when Rob and I last year started doing a side project of the chronology based on the book of Enoch and Jubilees, and we came across this testament of Levi, and when we put it within the chronology that we understand based on the book of Enoch, it happens exactly during the this. So what was it? The seventh week, I think, is the seven is the second temple second period. Temple period. The second temple period. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, it's very sad to see how Judah is in total defilement in abominations. They go from this holy, righteous people, and over time, compromising. Yeah. And then you finally get to a point where you're sacrificing to Molech and so forth. Yeah, yeah. it's just so sad. Yeah. Zephaniah chapter 2, gather yourselves together. Now gather together, O nation having no shame. Before the birth of the decree, the day flies away. Before the fierce anger of Yahweh overtakes you. Before the day of the anger of Yahweh overtakes you. Seek Yahweh, all you afflicted of the land who have fulfilled his law. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be concealed on the day of the anger of Yahweh. For Gaza will be abandoned, and Ashkelon is a desolation. As for Ashdod, at noon they will drive her away, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Woe to you, inhabitants of the region of the sea, people of the Carathites. The word of Yahweh is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines, and will destroy you until there is no inhabitant. And you, O region of the sea, shall become pastures and meadows for shepherds and sheep pens for the flocks. And it shall become a region for the remnant of the house of Judah, upon them they shall graze. And in the houses of Ashkelon they shall lie down in the evening. For Yahweh their God shall be mindful of them, and he will restore their fortunes. I have heard the reproaches of Moab and the scorning of the Ammonites, with which they have taunted my nation and made boasts against their territory. Therefore, as I live, a declaration of Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab shall be as Sodom, and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a place of weeds and salt pits and a desolation forever. The remnant of my people shall plunder them, and the remainder of my nation shall possess them. This shall be for them in place of their pride, because they mocked and boasted against the people of Yahweh of hosts. Yahweh will be awesome against them, for he will destroy all the gods of the earth and all the lands of the nations. Each in its place will bow down to him. You also, O Cushites, they shall be killed by my sword. And he will stretch out his hand against the north, and he will destroy Assyria and will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry wasteland like the desert. Herds shall lie down in her midst, every wild animal of the nation. Even the desert owl and the screech owl shall lodge on her capitals. A voice shall hoot in the window, rubble on the threshold, for the cedar is laid bare. 
This is the city of rejoicing that lived securely, the one saying in her heart, I am, and there is none besides me. How she has become a desolation, a lair for wild animals. Everyone who passes by her hisses and shakes his fist. So a few things I want to point out on Zephaniah chapter 2. is When he talks about in verse 3, Seek Yahweh, all you meek of the land who have fulfilled his law. Seek righteousness, seek humility. So he's giving us clarity here. All of the meek of the land who fulfill the law. So those who are being obedient, he's telling them, seek righteousness, seek humility. These are two, I think, pillars of our walk is to be obedient and to be humble. There's many people out there who use knowledge or have knowledge are very knowledgeable, intelligent, and they walk in a pride. They may or may not know it, or they, who knows, but they, there needs to be a humility that we all have. We can't presume that we're right about everything. We have to be humble. We know that we don't know it all. We are not We are not Yeshua. We are seekers of truth. Verse 11, Yahweh will be awesome against them. He will destroy all the gods of the earth and all the lands of the nations. And I thought that was very interesting that he mentions this and that people overlook this that Yahweh is going to destroy all the gods of this earth. And whether you want to take it as something superficial, idols, etc., but I believe that it is all-encompassing, but primarily those who are behind the scenes of this earth that have been given dominion over it. Verse 6, And you, O region of the sea, shall become pastures and meadows for shepherds. So we see something happening here that there's regions of sea that are going to become a pasture. It's going to dry up. That is mentioned. Verse 15. This is the city Nineveh. He gives a marker here of what he's describing. Of rejoicing that lives securely. The one saying in her heart, I am and there is none beside me. We remember reading all this in Revelation about the whore. How she has become a desolation. A lair for wild animals. Everyone who passes by her hisses and takes its fist. So we see this resemblance with Babylon and the whore Babylon. In Jeremiah 51, 36-37, we tie it in. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, look, I am going to contend your case, and I will avenge your vengeance, and I will cause her sea to dry up. So he's tying in, Jeremiah's tying in with Zephaniah on, the, on this description of what's going to take place on that day. And I will cause her foundation to dry up, and Babylon... See, Zephaniah is using the term Nineveh, and then here in Jeremiah, he's using the term Babylon, will become as a heap of stones, a layer of jackals, and an object of horror, and an object of hissing without inhabitants. Going to be desolation. Zephaniah, chapter 3. <laughs> Woe to you, O rebellious and defiled one, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She does not accept correction. In Yahweh she does not trust. To her God she does not draw near. Her officials in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They leave nothing until the morning. Her prophets are arrogant men of treachery. Her priests have defiled that which is holy. They do violence to the law. Yahweh is righteous in her midst. He does not do wickedness. Morning by morning he renders his judgment. At dawn he does not fail. But an evil one knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their strongholds are deserted. I have laid waste their streets so that none pass through. Their cities have been destroyed and are without a man, without an inhabitant. I have said, surely she will fear me. She will accept discipline. Then her dwelling place will not be cut down, nor all that I have brought upon her. Surely they rise early. They make all their deeds corrupt. Therefore, wait for me a declaration of Yahweh for the day of my rising as a witness. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out my wrath upon them, all my burning anger. For by the fire of my anger all the land shall be consumed. Because then I will make the speech of the nations pure, that all of them might call on the name of Yahweh, to serve him in unison. From beyond the rivers of Cush my worshippers and the daughter of my scattered ones shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be humiliated on account of all your deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I shall remove from your midst those exulting in your pride, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. And I will leave in your midst a people afflicted and poor, and they shall take refuge in the name of Yahweh. The remnant of Israel shall not do wickedness, they shall not speak deception, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall frighten them. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. 
cry aloud, O Israel, rejoice and be jubilant with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has annulled your judgments, he has turned away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst, you shall no longer fear misfortune. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, your hands shall not hang them. Yahweh your God is in your midst, a mighty warrior who saves. He shall rejoice over you with joy, he renews you in his love. He will exult over you with singing. I will gather those of you grieving on account of the feast, they were raising against her a reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change them from shame to glory and renown throughout the whole world. At that time I will bring you in, at the time of my gathering you together. For I will make you renowned and praised among all the nations of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says Yahweh. Zephaniah 3. Woe to you, O rebellious and defiled one, the oppressing city. So here we go, back to Nineveh, back to Babylon. I have cut off nations, their strongholds are deserted, laid waste through the streets, none pass through. The city has been destroyed without inhabitants. So this is like an Armageddon event that's being described here. And we just read about that in Zephaniah 2. I have said, surely she will fear me. She will accept discipline. Then her dwelling place will not be cut down, nor all I have brought upon her. Instead, they rise early. They make all their deeds corrupt. So they don't repent. So all of this destruction, all of this judgment and they still do not repent. So we, we see this pattern over and over of what's going on. Therefore, wait for me, a declaration of Yahweh, for the day of my rising as a witness, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out my wrath upon them, all of my burning anger, by the fire of my anger, all the land shall be consumed. This Armageddon event. And as we are looking at this, as we read different prophets describing similar events, whether it's all describing the same event or if it's describing multiple events. The question, is it cycles? Are these descriptions of these judgments in cycles? Because as we read scriptures, we see that the people of Israel do good, then they do bad, get punished. They do good, then they do bad, get punished. And we see these cycles. So I'm under the understanding that these are these events happen cyclically. I don't think I don't know if it's a specific timeline or it just happens when it happens. But I'm under the understanding that these judgments may possibly be describing different events or similar events of sorts that are happening during these quote cleansings, purgings, if you will, from what we read. The conversion of the heart and the harvest in verses nine to thirteen. Then I will make the speech of the nations pure, that all the men might call on the name of Yahweh to serve him in unison. So now, Akkad, on that day, I shall remove from your midst those exulting in pride, and there shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. In your midst a people afflicted and poor, and they shall take refuge in the name of Yahweh. The remnant of Israel shall not do wickedness, shall not speak deception, and nor shall they have a deceitful tongue in their mouth. They shall graze and lie down, and nothing will frighten them. So we see that their speech will be made pure. They will serve him in unison on that day, and all of the prideful, all of the haughty will be removed. And so we see a cleansing, a purging event that takes place that he is describing here. So 14 and 15, shout for joy, O daughter of Zion, cry aloud, O Israel, rejoice and be jubilant with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has annulled your judgments. He has turned away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You shall no longer fear misfortune. So here, this is Israel's joy and restoration being described here. In John 1, Nathaniel answered Yeshua, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And then in verse 51, Yeshua said to him, Truly I say to all of you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So whether that was an event they were going to literally see in their lifetime or at some point in the future, that is up to you. But we see him being described here as the king of Israel. And we see the king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. Both are given this title, Yahweh and Yeshua. And we know that Yahweh being the Father, being the King, gives all authority over to Yeshua, hence giving him that title. So verses 16 to 20, on that day, 
here it is again that day Yahweh your God is in the midst a mighty warrior who saves so describing Yahweh he shall rejoice over you with joy he renews you in his love he will exult over you with singing so I want to point out here it says I will gather those who are grieving on account of the appointed time they were raising against her a reproach so we see this harvest of the gathering of those who were against the good at that time i will deal with your oppressors now he's talking about the, those oppressors he will save the lame and gather the outcast i will change them from shame to glory and renown throughout the whole world the remnant the people he will change them over from the shame to glory and be renowned throughout the whole world at that time i will bring you in at the time of my gathering for i will make you renowned and praised among all the nations of the earth when i restore your fortunes before your eyes says yahweh think about this i will make you renowned and praised among all the nations of the earth he's making his people renowned among all the nations of the earth but if you're thinking if everyone is destroyed all the evils destroyed then Who's among the nations of the earth? You got to think about that. So people will continue. I'm reading this and it sounds like another cycle about to begin. Like <laughs> destruction and there's always a remnant left over from the evil somewhere, somehow. Out, yeah, out even there. when they conquered Canaan, they never they annihilated all of the evil. That's why history repeated itself. And yeah. even if you were to say all were destroyed, we see even the flood, all yeah. were destroyed. And then what happens? Mm -hmm. Again, we have Canaan um, gets yeah. gets the technology or the science and is already doing evil. Has turned from Noah and, and Yah, and here we go. We go back down to the wrong path again, and then the cycle begins again. Haggai chapter one. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day, the word of Yahweh came through Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak the high priest, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, this people says, The time has not come to rebuild the temple of Yahweh. And the word of Yahweh came through Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your houses that have been paneled while this house is desolate? And so then, thus says Yahweh of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much but have harvested little. You have eaten without being satisfied. You have drunk without being satiated. You have worn clothes without being worn. The one who earns wages puts it in a pouch with holes. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up the mountain and bring wood and build the house so that I may be pleased with it and honored, says Yahweh. You have looked for much, and look, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares Yahweh of hosts, because my house is desolate and you are running each to your own house. Therefore, because of you the heavens have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, on what the soil produces, on human beings and wild animals, and on all their labor, Zerubbabel son of Sheltiel, Joshua son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all the remnant of the people gave heed to the voice of Yahweh their God and to the words of Haggai the prophet, as Yahweh their God had sent him. And the people feared Yahweh. And Haggai the messenger of Yahweh spoke to the people with the message of Yahweh, saying, I am with you, declares Yahweh. And Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work on the house of Yahweh of hosts, their God, on the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. A quick recap of Haggai 1 being done in the second year of King Darius. On month six, day one, was the warning that was given. And they wasted their time in serving themselves and not Yah, so drought was on the land. Once again, disobedience causes these type of events. So basically the scenario here is that they started building the second temple, but they never finished. So Haggai here is warning them that all of the evil that is befalling them is because they are not finishing what they started. They need to finish building the temple rather than being busy with their daily routine. Yeah, they were getting acclimated to their new surroundings in yeah, Babel there. Mm -hmm. All right, obviously Zero Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the remnant of the people feared Yahweh. So we had a remnant there that came forth from this warning. And then on the 24th of that month, because they feared, they revered and obeyed, they were used to rebuild the house of Yahweh. So here we go. That's good. 
Haggai chapter 2. In the seventh month on the twenty-first day, the word of Yahweh came through Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua son of Jehazadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who among you is left that saw this house in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it seem like nothing to you? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares Yahweh. Take courage, Joshua son of Jehazadak, the high priest, and take courage, all the people of the land, declares Yahweh. Do the work, because I am with you, declares Yahweh of hosts, according to the promise that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit is with you, do not be afraid. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of all the nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says Yahweh of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares Yahweh of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says Yahweh of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares Yahweh of hosts. On the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to the prophet Haggai, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Ask now the priests for a ruling. If a man carries consecrated meat in the hem of his garment, and his hem touches bread, or stew, or wine, or olive oil, or any kind of food, will it become holy? The priests answered, No. And Haggai said, If one who is unclean from contact with a corpse touches any of these, will it become unclean? The priests answered, Yes, it will be become unclean. And Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people, and with this nation before me, declares Yahweh. And so it is with every kind of work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. But now, please consider from this day forward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of Yahweh. From that time when one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were only ten. And when one came to the wine vat to draw out fifty measures, there were only twenty. I struck you with blight, and with plant mildew, and hail, all the work of your hands. But you did not come back to me, declares Yahweh. Please consider from this day forward, from the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of Yahweh's temple was laid, consider, is there still seed in the store chamber? Do the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree still produce nothing? From this day forward I will bless you. And the word of Yahweh came to Haggai a second time on the twenty-fourth day of the month, saying, Say to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the military strength of the kingdoms of the nations. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers, horses and their riders will fall, every one by the sword of another. On that day, declares Yahweh of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel son of Sheltiel, my servant, declares Yahweh, and I will make you a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares Yahweh of hosts. The coming glory of the temple, according to the promise, my spirit is with you, that is being spoken of. And he talks about in a little while prophecy in, in Haggai 2. And then on 924, the foundations laid and blessings for defiled people. Zerubbabel is chosen as a signet on that day. And here it says that Yahweh chooses him. And we see that a seal here, engravings of a seal as a model for cutting names and inscriptions on precious stones and gold plates, a template. So that signet is, that term is like a, an engraving of a seal that Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel was chosen as. And we see in 2 Timothy 2.19, however, the solid foundation of Elohim stands firm, having his, this seal, Yahweh knows those who are his, and everyone whose names the name of Messiah must abstain from unrighteousness. And we just read, they feared Yah. Zerubbabel was righteous and he was leading the people at the time and Yah chose him to be that template that had a seal upon him. So the coming glory of the temple in a little while that's mentioned here. I wanted to touch on a few things with that term a little while and where it says in verse nine, the later glory of the house will be greater than the former in its place and I will give peace. We read in Jeremiah 51:33, for thus says Yahweh of hosts, the El of Israel, the daughter of Babylon, here we go, we're talking about this, is like a threshing floor at the time of the trodden down, just a little while, and the time of the harvest will come to her. Revelation 20, verse 3, and through him, talking about the dragon, into the abyss, and shut it and sealed it from above, above him, in order that he could not deceive the nations again until a thousand years are completed. After these things, it is necessary for him to be released for a short time, a little while. 
Daniel 7, 11 to 12. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words, which the horn was speaking. I kept looking in, in, until the beast was killed and his body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. The rest of the beast's dominion was taken away with an extension of life for an appointed season of time. And I believe that appointed season time is during that short time, that little while time, which is after the beast was destroyed. His dominion will come back. Daniel 7, 25, 26. And he will speak against the Most High, wear down the saints of the Most High, and they will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half time. But the court will convey for judgment, and his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. And I know I hypothesized time and half of time, possibly being one time is 100 years, a times is 200 years, and half a time is like 50 years. So possibly 350 years of the short season is a possibility. John chapter 17. Yeshua said these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, in order that your Son may glorify you, just as you have given him authority over all flesh, in order that he would give eternal life to them, everyone whom you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Yeshua Messiah, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth by completing the work that you have given me to do. And now, Father, you glorify me at your side with the glory that I had at your side before the world existed. I have revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you have given them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they understand that all the things that you have given me are from you, because the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they received them and know truly that I have come from you, and they have believed that you have sent me. I am asking on behalf of them. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you have given me, because they are yours. And all my things are yours, and your things are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, and they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given to me, so that they may be one, just as we are. When I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given to me, and guarded them, and none of them has perished except the Son of Destruction, in order that the Scripture would be fulfilled. And now I am coming to you, and I am saying these things in the world so that they may have my joy completed in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for them I sanctify myself, so that they themselves also may be sanctified in the truth. And I do not ask on behalf of these only, but also on behalf of those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be in us, in order that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory that you have given to me I have given to them, in order that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, in order that they may be completed in one, so that the world may know that you sent me. And you have loved them just as you have loved me. Father, those whom you have given to me, I want that those also may be with me where I am, in order that they may see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, although the world does not know you, yet I have known you, and these men have come to know that you sent me. And I made known to them your name, and will make it known, in order that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I may be in them. John chapter 18. When Yeshua had said these things, he went out with his disciples to the other side of the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. So Judas, taking the cohort and officers from the chief priests and from the Pharisees, came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, because he knew all the things that were coming upon him, went out and said to them, Who are you looking for? They replied to him, Yeshua the Nazarene. He said to them, I am he. So when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Who are you looking for? And they said, Yeshua the Nazarene. Yeshua replied, I said to you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. In order that the word that he had spoken would be fulfilled, those whom you have given to me, I have not lost any one of them. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. So Yeshua said to Peter, Put the sword into its sheath. The cup that the Father has given me, shall I not drink it? Then the cohort and the military tribune and the officers of the Jews seized Yeshua and tied him up, and brought him to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. So Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. But Peter was standing by the door outside. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. 
Then the female slave who was the doorkeeper said to Peter, You are not also one of the disciples of this man, are you? He said, I am not. So the high priest questioned Yeshua about his disciples and about his teaching. Yeshua replied to him, I have spoken openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogue and in the temple courts where all the Jews assemble, and I have said nothing in secret. Why are you asking me? Ask those who heard what I have said to them. Behold, these people know what I said. Now when he had said these things, one of the officers who was standing by gave a slap in the face to Jesus, saying, Do you reply to the high priest in this way? Yes, you were replied to him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify about what is wrong. But if I have spoken correctly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him, tied up, to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there and warming himself. So they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, who was related to the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? So Peter denied it again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Then they brought Yeshua from Caiaphas to the governor's residence. Now it was early, and they did not enter into the governor's residence so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate came outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have handed him over to you. So Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, It is not permitted for us to kill anyone, in order that the word of Yeshua would be fulfilled that he had spoken, indicating by what sort of death he was going to die. Then Pilate entered again into the governor's residence and summoned Yeshua and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yeshua replied, Do you say this from yourself, or have others said this to you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your people and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Yeshua replied, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Then Pilate said to him, So then you are a king. Yeshua replied, You say that I am a king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I have come into the world, in order that I can testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no basis for an accusation against him. But it is your custom that I release for you one prisoner at the Passover. So do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? Then they shouted again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. On verses 1 to 3, Yeshua is praying. This is Yeshua's prayer. He says, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son in order that your Son may glorify you, as you give him dominion of all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give them everlasting life, that they may know you, the only true El, and whom you have sent, Yeshua Mashiach. So we read back in John, also chapter 12, 23 to 25, and 49 to 50. He's talking about the time has come. The Son of Man will be exalted. And then he talks about the mustard seed. If it dies, and then once it dies, then it gives much fruit, the seed itself. And then he says, For I do not speak of myself, but the Father who sent me. And Yeshua says this so many times of how he didn't come to speak for himself. And then it says, I know that his commandment is everlasting life, and that which I speak is identical to that which the Father speaks, so I speak. And then quickly I wanted to point out on verses 11 to 26. Here we see, I'm not in the world anymore. He's talking about that. Set, up, set apart, Father, keep them in your name. He's praying to keep people, his people, in your name, those whom you gave me, that they may be a cod as we are a cod. While I abode with them, I keep them in your name. But now I am coming to you and speak these words in the world in order that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your words and the world has a report against them. I do not plead that you will take them from the world, but you will keep them from evil. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. All right. And, as, and then he talks about the light which you give me, I will give them, that they may be a cod as we are a cod. All right, let's look further on what that light is down below. Father, I desire that you, whom you gave to me, that in the place where I will be, there they may be with me, in order that they may see my light. And that light is a seal. And when you look up that word seal, it's 
reference that as apostleship, which you gave me. So I believe that the light that we are given, we are to take the light or have that light and teach, tell others, share with others, be examples. We are to do. We're given this apostleship, if you will, this light to shine. Because without shining a light, you aren't anybody, you aren't anything. You're darkness, you're dead. And so this is describing that or giving it an adverb on what we are to do, what this light means. Here I have made you known upon the earth the work which you gave me to do. I have, and what, is, what is exactly is he talking about here? We read in John 13, 12 to 17, Yeshua tells us to do as he does in his foot washing parable to show that the servant is no greater than his Adonai. John 12, 26, He who wants to serve me, let him serve following after me. And at the place where I am, my servant must be. He who serves me, my father will honor him. And let's talk about the kingdom here. His first words of his ministry recorded were in Mark 1, 15. This is the time of fulfillment. Kingdom of Yah is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Yeshua speaks of the kingdom 36 times in Matthew, 14 times in Mark, and 32 times in Luke. And parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. It's like leaven. It's like a treasure. It's like a merchant. It's like a net. It's like a householder, a man going on a journey, etc. The kingdom is both present and future. Requirement is repentance. The change of mind. It's belief in trusting. So you must have a change of mind to weigh things. And understand things and then an entrustment is your belief and then the faith is the fidelity to do it to be obedient so all of those are the requirements you must entrust wholeheartedly and you must walk it out in obedience and then love when the Pharisees asked Yeshua about the greatest commandment he replied that it was to love Yah and love others all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments in other words, the law was subject to the guiding value of love. So on the last page, you can see the variant sticker for this week. Almost no variance between the Dead Sea Scrolls version and the Masoretic version. And between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the LXX version, there are just a few insignificant variants and we have eight somewhat significant variants in the prophets. No variants in the Torah section, just in the prophets. And then between the LXX and Masoretic, we have quite a few variants that are somewhat significant. And then there are just a couple of highly significant variants in the Torah and in the prophets. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you for following along and listening, and we look forward to comments once we stop the recording. Thank you. God bless.